Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. When you go on holiday, what's important to you? What's your priority? Relaxation. You ready to relax, huh? Relax and see, and see the sights. Mm -hmm. If money or time were no object to you, what would a dream vacation be? What? Just what we're doing. Here in Victoria, yes. huh? This is what's our dream. <laughs> Just being able to come here and seeing this part of the world. When you go on a holiday, what's important to you? Weather. The weather? You like to go someplace warm or someplace cool? Someplace warm and nice weather, like home. So, get away from snow and ice and all that, and rain, here from rain. Uh, what about things like time with family? Is Are you trying to get away from family or be close to family while you're on vacation? Be close to with family. So you go together as a family? Uh, how about things like seeing new sites, stuff like that? Oh. You like going to new places? You like going to the same place every year that's sort of comfortable? I like to go to new new place. Yeah, new place. Yeah. See new sites? Yeah. 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 If, if money were no object, what would your dream vacation be? <laughs> <laughs> no money. No, if, no, no. It doesn't, it doesn't matter about like money. It doesn't matter about time. you got all the time oh. in the world and all the money yeah. to do what you want. What would you do? I want to go on a cruise. Ah. Yeah. On a big ship? Yeah. yeah. Tell me a little bit more. What's what's yeah. cool about a cruise? I can get nice sun anytime, like on the sea. Weather. Yeah. And I like sea, so I can see. We can see a nice view. The point would be to be someplace nice and sunny and yeah, out on the ocean. Close with my family or friends on the ship. Yeah. It's not important for me, like casino and stuff. Okay. What about you guys? Where would you? I I will stay. Yeah, luxurious hotel. Yeah. <laughs> I... Room service? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Are we talking spa here with the masseuse coming by every yeah, day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Casino more so. Yeah. Uh, you like a casino. Yeah, yeah, well money's no object, sure. yeah. <laughs> How about you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a good idea to go to hotel and then just I'm relaxing. Yeah. So just taking it easy, having other people pamper you. Okay. Are you from Victoria? No, I'm from Switzerland. When you go on holiday, yeah. what's important to you? Yeah, for, important for me is to see new things, new people, to meet new people. Maybe to learn the language, like now, English. Holiday is also good for rest and take time to think about. If money or time were no object, what would be your dream vacation? Maybe to go to Alaska to look all the nice nature and yeah, maybe to see some animals there, like moose and whales and something, and then to travel around. Okay, well, thanks a lot. When you go on holiday, what's important to you? Getting away, getting to a new place, getting some rest, spending time with your family, anything like that? Something new, something fun, spontaneous, relaxing. Uh huh. Exciting. If money and time were immaterial, what would be your dream vacation? I'd probably go to Jamaica. Jamaica? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't really make plans. I'd go and... Just um, figure it out once you got there? Yeah, All pretty right. much. Okay, when you go on holiday, what's important to you? Oh, definitely rest to go into a new place. Long as it's and relax. If money and time were immaterial, what would be your dream vacation? Oh, I'd love to uh, take a Mediterranean cruise. Stop in Egypt to see the uh, pyramids of Giza, the Temple of Karnak, that sort of thing. Definitely love Egypt. <laughs> Have you been there before? No, no, but I'm a, a big study of Egyptology. So. Okay, so that makes sense.
Tourism Victoria is a not-for-profit industry association responsible for the development and promotion of tourism in Greater Victoria. It is funded operationally by over 900 business members, five area municipalities, and Tourism British Columbia. Tourism Victoria is responsible for destination advertising, market research, increasing leisure travel, and meeting and incentive travel for the Greater Victoria destination. It is responsible for servicing visitor inquiries, including providing information, making accommodation bookings, selling activity tickets, and fulfilling mail and email requests. Tourism Victoria maintains two offices in Victoria. One is the nation's busiest visitor info center at 812 Wharf Street. The other is the administration office at 31 Bastion Square. I spoke with Melissa McLean, Director of Operations and Communications for Tourism Victoria, at her Bastion Square office. How dependent is Victoria on tourism? Victoria economy is, I think, very dependent on tourism. We are many things as a community, certainly. We're a government town, a university college town, a military town, but tourism is the number one primary industry. And the distinction there is that it's bringing new money into the economy to circulate through that economy. Mm -hmm. So we have an annual tourism revenues here of just over a billion dollars. But when you think of the true value of tourism as it starts to multiply when the person in tourism gets their paycheck and then starts to spend it in the community, when the hotel pays their suppliers, the industry is really worth about $1.7 billion to wow. the Victoria economy. How do you go about promoting Victoria outside of Victoria? Well, you know, it's an interesting question. When you promote a beautiful city, a lot of people think you don't need to. They think that uh, it's sort of like field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. <laughs> and it's really not the case. People are bombarded with marketing messages, including about where they ought to travel, as well as how they ought to spend their disposable income, period. So not only do we compete against other destinations in the world, we compete against, well, this year buy an SUV instead of going on a big vacation. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very much uh, building upon the success that we've had over the years with tourism having been intertwined in the economy here from the arrival of the first European settlers. And the first marketing message was certainly around a little bit of old England. Uh, there's a certain market that likes that message, and so we still have an element of that messaging in mm -hmm. our marketing. Uh, for example, American visitors really like it. It helps them see Canada as more foreign than a lot of Americans tend to see us typically mm -hmm. a place, and our Japanese visitors quite like it. But beyond that, we're for the growth for us has been very much has been in promoting the natural beauty of Victoria mm -hmm. and doing that through having people see this area as the launching pad for spectacular adventure vacations mm -hmm. that range from soft to hard adventure. I think th that people often had a perception previously around adventure as being something very high risk where you've got to be rappelling off a mountain or hell and skiing. jumping. That yeah, kind of but yeah. for it to qualify as adventure. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Tourism BC's uh, slogan for the past 20 plus years has been Supernatural British Columbia. And you see in the advertising people roaring through rapids and, and rappelling down mountains and so forth. There's been a real evolution of what is adventure travel thanks to the baby boomer and it all ties in I think very much to the baby boomers desire to find a fountain of youth to extend life as long as possible to be active even in their holiday pursuits and so there's a whole continuum from soft meaning low risk adventure activities like uh, low impact hiking, uh, bird watching, which actually ranks as the number one leisure activity yeah, of today's baby boomer. Are they actually like buying the binoculars and going out with the little guidebooks and looking for rare birds, or is it oh, just yes. hiking? Or well, there's there's all le levels of bird watchers, but. Uh, it's absolutely buying the binoculars and hiding out in <laughs> the marshlands and forests. There's everything from the golf and the freshwater fishing, and you start to ramp it up in level of risk until you find yourself at that hard end of mm -hmm. the adventure equation. And that has been really spectacular for us as marketers because people get the combined benefit of this being a city, albeit the most uncity-like city a lot of people have ever been to, 
uh, where you can have the comfort of the wonderful luxurious hotels and all of the restaurants and attractions and so forth and you can spend your day out at Gowland Todd Range Provincial Parks hiking and bird watching and enjoying and then come back to an amazing West Coast dining experience and you know cuddle up underneath the, the plush duvet comforter. <laughs> You kind of have a taste of everything. Yeah. Then. Do you use a lot of your own original market research, or is a lot of what you know about the market come from like centralized sources in tourism, where you read other studies that kind of give you general information, and then you see where Victoria can tap into that? Well, being on an island is a bit of a blessing, in that folks have got to hit a certain point of departure off of the island where typically there is, we hope, a short waiting time to depart. And what we've done is, uh, in conjunction with the University of Victoria, from the late 1980s onwards, conducted exit surveys, uh -huh. where as folks are at the various outbound transportation terminals, we have surveys asking them in fair detail what they did on their trip. So it's not speculative, it's not what do you think you'll do while you're here, it's okay, you just finished your vacation experience, tell us everything. Mm -hmm. And we've gathered over 10, 12 years some amazing primary data about people. And of course we augment that with the research that's out there from Tourism British Columbia and the Canadian Tourism Commission and then private sources. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mountains and mountains of it. Uh, and a lot of it is around uh, what causes groups of people to decide to move in a certain direction. Right now we've got staff on a 16-day road trip through Washington, Oregon, Northern California promoting Victoria as a family destination for the summer. And the focus is more activity oriented around uh, commercial attractions you can visit, parks the kids can play in, uh, things the whole family can do together. Mm -hmm. The key market that we seem to attract is the couple referred to in our industry as the empty nester mm -hmm. where quite often both husband and wife are still working, the kids have flown the nest, the house mortgage is paid down, the car mortgage is hopefully gone. These are folks who don't necessarily have a lot of time but they've got disposable income and they need to get off the urban rat race. Mm -hmm. And so for them, we're pitching luxury, sanctuary, but still activity. Mm -hmm. Seniors are very interesting because they used to be very straightforward. They sat on a bus and went on a bus tour, like a 21-day you know, <laughs> tour of the Rockies. And the, you know, that was very easy for us as tourism marketers to see and understand how to deal with. Well, seniors are so much more active now that we're seeing huge shifts in the bus tour market, declines to be quite honest, and mm -hmm. we're seeing seniors heading out on their own. We're seeing them in elder hostel programs where these are not low-level workshops they're attending. They're with a, a marine biologist from the University of Victoria studying tide pools, then spending the next day with uh, an archaeologist at the Royal BC Museum. I mean, these folks are digging in. <laughs> and so the whole growth around learning vacations, it spans many age groups, but in particular, the seniors have just a massive appetite for this type of vacation. There are a lot of vacation destinations uh, nowadays that kind of offer a fantasy. They're, they really aren't life experiences in the sense of, you know, like getting out in the wild here or on the island or something like that. You go to a park, it's very contained, you're, you're inside a fenced area and experiences are provided for you. Um, being authentic is really important because we believe that people want to come to a community and to varying degrees experience life as the locals do. And I admit that is to varying degrees. Some mm -hmm. folks are here to rent a cabin, read a book, look at the ocean and never even talk to a soul. And then there's <laughs> someone on the other side of the spectrum that wants to, you know, become a local. <laughs> uh, so, so for us, we really present Victoria very much as it is. Uh, although certainly there are those who criticize us, who say, well, if you're presenting Victoria as it is, then why are social issues of concern to you? Why do you rile against panhandling and so forth? Mm -hmm. Are you trying to create uh, some sort of a, a magic kingdom for visitors so they don't see the real Victoria? And we say, well, no, we think that social issues are a community issue and we think that we need to address issues like homelessness for the people who are homeless, for the community overall, 
and the visitors are almost incidental to that. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes we're misperceived as attempting to create, in a way, a fantasy, maybe not a Disneyland, but this perfect paradise. And it's kind of, a, it's an inaccurate perception of what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. We're going to talk a little bit about our vacation. Well, it wasn't really a vacation. It was sort of a move, but we treated it as a vacation in September of 2000. It was kind of a combination vacation and move. And we took our time. We left North Carolina and drove all the way out to Victoria. It was an interesting route because we started out by leaving our family in North Carolina. And the first couple of stops along the trip were visiting friends and family. Now, once we got past Minneapolis or got to Minneapolis, we did didn't have any friends or family, so we started doing uh, the hotel slash, what do you call those things, attractions along the highway route. Points of interest. Ah, yes, points I of interest. I think it's a tour bookism for them. It had a little bit of everything. I mean, the first part of the trip was visiting family, and then the next part of the trip, but visiting friends in big cities where there was something to do. Then we were out in the middle of the prairie, kind of doing the American tourist thing, and then we were doing the sightsee as we drive by thing. It was a vacation. It was many vacations in one. It was a multiple vacation. It was a simulated vacation. Ah, uh, yes. The Mall of America is an easy target. And it was the first sort of kitsch stop on the way. It was a, a four-story mall. I think the largest in the world. No, West Edmonton is the largest in the world. Oh, they argue over that all the time. Yeah, so right away the notion of uh, objectivity is out the window because apparently it's it something be that can be had, that can be claimed. And that self-identification suffices to establish. It can be measured in several different ways, too. Number of visitors, number of square footage, number of stores. Proximity to the Vikings training camp. <laughs> or to the, uh, oh, what's the name of the stadium that the Twins and the Vikings play in? The Metrodome. Is that right? Yes. Or, that's probably I think it's the Hubert Dome, isn't it? Hubert Humphrey. Hubert Humphrey, that's it. <laughs> There isn't another H in there. It's Hubert Horatio Humphrey, wasn't it? I don't know. His middle name began with an H, but I don't recall what it was. No, it's all run by H. <laughs> Jesse, the governing body of Ventura. <laughs> yeah, Ventura. So actually, the whole Minneapolis-St. Paul area has become something of a simulation. <laughs> There's a lack of uh, authenticity to it. When your governor used to be a wrestler, a wrestler. Well, the stock line that the wrestlers have, no other rest of wrestling is fake, is that it's no more fake than the rest of everything else <laughs> into our real life. And what frightens me is that they may be right. You know, like Baudrillard's comment about Disneyland, that the real the real sham surrounding Disneyland was not that they put together this sort of fantasy world for you. It was that once you crossed out of the, once you went out of the exit back into the real world, that it was in fact the real world and not just as simulated in just the same way that Disneyland was. I think that was a bit pessimistic, but I think that the point needed to be raised anyway. Oh, yeah, and then there's Lake Wobegon, which is a simulated hometown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I never even thought about that. But they were in the mall, man. There was a Lake Wobegon store, which was one of the coolest stores in the mall. Yeah, I bought a, I bought a T-shirt there that said so many books a little time, and the proceeds supposedly went to Minnesota Public Radio. And a lot of people don't know that the Prairie Home Companion in Lake Wobegon was a figment of Keeler. Garrison Keeler's imagination. So. It is mythical. So then we took off after Minneapolis, and we saw the... Well, first we saw southwest Minnesota. And, and, and the ghost town, and you knew it was a ghost town because it had its own sign that said, Ghost Town. Oh, yeah, somebody put up... The last guy to leave put up the sign before he left. It was the only <laughs> thing we could figure out. But it was complete with wind and tumbleweed, so, you know... <laughs> And there was nobody there. Oh, yeah, that was that was nice about <laughs> with the tumbleweeds. That added real verisimilitude. Because the cat sort of became a kite from the wind as we were taking her out in the leash. Oh, that was on, at the Missouri. We stopped at the Missouri River. They were planting additional grass there to simulate the prairie because the real grass had been killed by everybody tramping all over it. Well, the this, simulated teepee, remember that? Oh, yeah, the yeah, simulated the teepee. teepee. Oh, God. It was a sculpture of a teepee. Yes. Uh, and then it got really kitschy because we went to Mitchell, South Dakota, Oh, that was before. Mitchell is uh, east of the Missouri River. Yeah. So we saw the, we saw Mitchell before we saw the Missouri River. 
Yeah. And we saw the Corn Palace, which is a big old building in Mitchell, South Dakota, that they redecorate with fresh corn every year and entertaining shit. No, it's not fresh corn. It's dried out corn. Well, yes, but it's, I don't mean fresh in the literal sense. I mean fresh in the, uh, the it's sense It's the of, leftover corn. Yes, as opposed to the old corn <laughs> that they dispose so of. Uh, from the year before. They use corn removal techniques and then put the fresh corn in appealing patterns. To create Some a, representation or some otherwise to create a colorful corn mosaic effect. Which they redesign every year. I think they went back to the 19th century. We saw photographs it was of the corn palace. 1898 or 1893. I'm not sure which. One year, I believe 1913, they had a swastika on the front. This was while it was still, well, before it had acquired its current signified, as it were. Yeah. And the proprietors of the corn palace had put up a sign saying essentially this, saying it doesn't mean Nazism. It's a good luck symbol that pops up in certain cultures. And I noted from my own reading that Kipling had used it in a couple of his, of his books. He'd appropriated it from... Uh, the Indians, we lived there. And there's and it a wasn't one called a swastika. It has like a hundred, a hundred other names, but it just looks like a swastika. Yeah, it's a pretty common symbol. And there's a woman looking at one of the photographs of this f- photograph in particular of the swastika bearing corn palace. And I began giving her a short history of the swastika and told her essentially what I told you. She said, um, I know quite a lot about this new work here. And I decided to have some fun with her. And I said, well, until two weeks ago when they fired me, so I just come here and do this for free now. And I think she believed me until Patty uh, had to dissuade her from her belief. Yeah, she was to, scaring to from me. Herself. She was believing you so badly. I was like, oh no, we can't let this poor woman leave here uh, freaked out. I must have had the air of credibility. Anyway, after Mitchell, after the Missouri River, we did the Badlands, I think, was the next stop. And that was scant- quite beautiful, but there still was simulated stuff there. The simulated herds. Mm-hmm. They had simulated herds of antelope. The antelope were not simulated, but the herds were in the sense that they weren't naturally occurring anymore. They had been restocked. There was also supposedly that we didn't see, and we saw the antelope, but we didn't see the 500 head of buffalo that were supposed to be running around in there somewhere. The Badlands was kind of a turning point for me on that trip. I mean, we had sort of done the kitschy stuff, and it was kind of fun, you know, and we didn't take the route that takes you by the big ball of string, but I thought about that. It was that kind of a trip up until then. But I had read earlier in the summer, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and I had read about this area, the Badlands is in, because that book is about the history in the mid 1800s of the Oglala. Oglala, when the Oglala had resisted the whites coming into the area. And the Badlands is adjacent to uh, the Black Hills, and the Black Hills are a very sacred land to the Sioux. Wounded Knee was probably, what, about 50 miles south of where we were? We didn't go all the way down to Wounded Knee. I actually don't know where Wounded Knee is. I think it's in. Still in South Dakota, but almost in Nebraska, and um, it is in the Black Hills. When I got there, and when I realized that what I was looking at, the land that I was looking at, was what I had read about earlier in the summer, my feelings about the place began to change. And it was kind of interesting because the kitschiness continued. I mean, we went to Rushmore, and there was all this kind of official line, if you will, official story of what Rushmore was all about. And there were like all these little trinkets that you could buy. And we had lunch at the um, cafeteria at Rushmore and and they have the all-American meal that's served to you by a foreign exchange student. All the wait staff there were from other countries. They had the countries displayed in their nameplates just so that you knew that. And the all-American meal consisted of a hamburger, fries, what else was it? It was hot dog. A hot dog, that's right. And apple Potato pie. Chips. We took a photograph Coke just for the sake of documentation. <laughs> yes. We wanted to be believed on this one. And, uh, you know, it was sort of like the simulated melting pot in the cafeteria. It was kind of weird. It was sort of like we were we were being treated to a... Fake unity? Yeah. I, I don't want to quite say fake because that sort of implies something that I'm I'm not sure is true, but it was it was a forced one. It was a forced unity. I mean, I think the exchange students were genuinely trying to help, and I think that they were genuinely happy to be in the park. And I think that the motivation of the park in having all of the flags and having all of the exchange students there and everything was probably a good motive. I don't think it was like wrestling where they were really trying to present something that wasn't real, but it still didn't ring true. It had a stuck-together feel about it, a simulated feel about it. Then knowing what the history is of Rushmore and knowing that that was a way of stamping on sacred ground, the white imprint, I mean, it just has an imperialistic background to it. And, of course, nothing in the park went after that. Nothing in the park said, and oh, by the way, this is a monument to imperialism. But in a lot of ways, it really was. I mean, it was really saying, ha-ha, we won, we beat the natives. And, uh, And this proves it because we etched 
the faces of our leaders into your sacred ground. So I felt I felt very odd there. It had a surreal kind of fairy feeling to it in a lot of ways, and a shameful feeling. It, it was not a part of history that I was very proud of. And the same day that we went to Rushmore, we went to the memorial for Crazy Horse, and it was an interesting contrast because uh, Rushmore was built. Do you remember how quickly? Uh, I think it did it all in one day. No. <laughs> I actually don't know. Yeah. I think it was like 13 or 14 years, though. I don't think it was a long, long time. Crazy Horse, on the other hand, was begun in the 1930s. There was actually a a native man who was still alive in the 1930s who remembered Crazy Horse from when he was a kid. Uh, He was very elderly, what, about 70, 75? And he hired a sculptor who sculpted the what is going to be the memorial by him describing his memories of Crazy Horse. And then the sculptor drew and said, you know, and did kind of like the police sketch thing where this this is how you remembered it and so forth. There's no actual picture of Crazy Horse anywhere. So this is from that chief's memory. And it's a beautiful picture with Crazy Horse on his horse pointing toward the horizon. And they've been working on it. They've been blasting on it for nearly 70 years now. And all that's been blasted out of the mountain is about the head and part of the arm. None of the horse's head or any of the other part of his body has been blasted out. And I think the difference there is as simple as funding. The Mount Rushmore Project was funded publicly, and Crazy Horse has been funded privately, and private funding just hasn't been there for the latter project. So it's not especially mysterious on that level. But they have done some nice things there. They've put together a wonderful museum, and it has a lot of great information about the Sioux about the history of the place, about Native's um, history since then. It's a a culture center. They have powwows there, that kind of thing. Uh, It's a place where the Natives who are living in the areas on the reservations there have as a center for their culture. And I believe that some of the funding that comes into the place has actually helped the tribes in the area. One of the reasons why it's been slow going is that when money is given to the memorial, it's not all spent on just blasting the mountain. It's spent on improving the lives of the people there. Well, the rest of the trip wasn't quite as a a study in contrast as that little area in South Dakota was. And it's a trip that I remember very fondly, in spite of the fact that there was, it wasn't exactly an escape. It ended up being sort of an enriching experience, but not what I would call an escape from reality experience, if there is such a thing as reality. No, I'd say that somebody had contextualized the West Quite inescapably. I wouldn't call it an escape at all. I'd call it a verification that escape is not really a possibility that you can't go home. So we are about to embark on an experimental style of book review, a kind of dueling book review in which we place two books in comparison to each other in order to understand a topic more thoroughly. I will be discussing George Ritzer's Enchanting a Disenchanted World revolutionizing the means of consumption. Along with his book, The McDonaldization of Society, Ritzer's project is to look at the ways in which consumption economics are changing social relationships. I really like his work. His writing is accessible, especially for a postmodern approach, and yet he doesn't dumb his stuff down. He challenges capitalism where it lives at the end of the 20th century. My book will be Simulations by Jean Baudrillard. Simulations consists of two essays by Baudrillard, the first of which is entitled The Procession of Simulacra, and the second of which is entitled The Orders of Simulacra. The essays are an attack on metaphysics, both deconstructing the notion of a pre-existing real, a notion Baudrillard calls the reality principle, and rhetorically reversing the privileged status of any pre-existing real over its simulations assigning privilege instead to the simulations Baudrillard calls hyper-real. I would like to discuss Ritzer's text and Baudrillard's text in light of vacations. As a mobile society, Canadians hold their, quote, holidays, close quote, as sacred. It is a time when people go somewhere. Ritzer would suggest that that somewhere is changing as North Americans become more consumption-driven. A great deal of the consumption done on holidays has always centered around food, a place to stay, and souvenirs. The latter has been kitschy for a while, 
especially with the advent of plastics in the 1920s and 30s. But Ritzer asserts that the fakeness has spread to the food and the places to stay, as well as the little plastic trinkets marking the trips. Amusement parks have outgrown the Ferris wheels and roller coasters of the 1950s and 60s to become full-scale shopping meccas where people eat, sleep, shop, and get thrills. Ritzer writes, quote, For one thing, malls have become tourist destinations. Malls have everything. They have an amusement park. They have a roller coaster. This combination is spectacular and a powerful lure to the traveler. In Canada, the largest tourist attraction is not Niagara Falls, but rather the Edmonton Mall. Close quote. Baudrillard implies inevitability of the simulacrum. He attributes to it a presence that trumps that of the objectively existing, not merely mocking the validity of the original, but superseding it. It begs the question of what is real, and does so in a way that exposes the term as untenable. He sets up a hierarchy of simulation, four levels which he calls orders. The first order is that which attempts to emulate an original. The second order is that which misrepresents an original. The third order attempts to create the impression of an original where none exists. The fourth order is that which bears no relation to anything that could be called an original. He delights in exposing the self-consciously artificial. Among his examples are the Tassaday tribe being returned to its, quote, natural habitat, close quote, and, quote, maintained there, close quote, by the, quote, scientists, close quote, who had discovered them. Also cited are the caves of Lascaux, which, subsequent to their discovery, were barred to the public inspection beyond glances through a small plate of clear plastic, but whose discoverers constructed a replica nearby for the purposes of public inspection. Our travels have produced a similar experience. We traveled through the Badlands of South Dakota in the summer of 2000 and were surprised to encounter, among other things, a number of antelope at play in the region, as in the song, Home on the Range. I had been under the impression that they had been largely driven off or killed outright by Caucasian settlers in the 19th century. My confusion was ended by a sign by the road informing passers-by that the area had been restocked with the creatures, reintroduced to the area for reasons upon which I dare not speculate. Ritzer points out that malls are full of simulations as well. Not only the obvious amusement park simulations that take traditionally outdoor products and place them in the confines of monstrously large buildings, but also simulated, quote, natural, close quote, experiences such as rainforests, as in the Rainforest Cafe. He also talks about, quote, authentic simulations, close quote, such replicas of historical places such as the colonial village in Williamsburg, Virginia, or a visit to the Windsor Castle in England. While the site of the vacation is, quote, real, close quote, in some sense, the experiences are manufactured and are offered as a spectacle. I guess Baudrillard would call these first-order simulations, though I doubt that the Rain Tree Cafe is trying to accurately emulate a rainforest. Still, they had real parrots, as I recall. Baudrillard has a section in his book devoted to Disneyland. He calls it a third-order simulation, not because it is a deliberately infantile quasi-culture, but because its latent function is to deter visitors from the realization that the world outside Disneyland, meaning the rest of California, the rest of the United States, and the remaining area of the globe, is just as simulated as Disneyland. When one leaves Disneyland, one is not going back to the, quote, real world, close quote. Baudrillard's proposition is that Disneyland was made manifest to combat the notion that there was a border defining and enclosing its imperatives. That's interesting in light of Ritzer's theory regarding why these simulations exist. Ritzer uses Max Weber's understanding of institutional rationality to contrast how these consumption meccas actually function and how they feel to the consumer. On the one hand, such places as Disneyland or Mall of Americas are a controlled environment, complete with surveillance, guards, gates, fences, etc. They are also places of businesses and are discussed in boardrooms and portfolios in terms of growth rates and returns on investments. These symbols express a rational view of such places, 
measuring, calculating, and controlling these institutions with precision and predictability. In this discourse, such places are disenchanted and rational. On the other hand, these places are meant to be sources of escape from the rationalized world. People who deal in highly rationalized spaces pick vacation spots as, quote, getaways, close quote. Disney is supposed to be a place far removed from bottom-line thinking, a place where troubles are forgotten and fantasies come to life. Ritzer writes, quote, the cathedrals of consumption can be described as being highly rationalized. Rationalization leads to disenchantment. Rational means of consumption can themselves have enchanting qualities inherent in their rationalized natures. In spite of the latter, the central problems confronting the cathedrals of consumption remain rationalization and the disenchantment engendered by it." However, Baudrillard regards the historical genesis of simulation as running counter to the conceptual underpinnings of capitalism, and of communism for that matter. He typifies the Industrial Revolution as being informed by certain ideas of a teleological nature regarding materialism, production, and universalism. The revolution, like all other revolutions, needed an ideology, and it had one. But the onset of simulation disinformed the precepts of the industrial ideology, making them obsolete from the day that reproducibility became the criterion for what would be produced. Baudrillard cites Marshall McLuhan's work and notes its similarity to his own. Ritzer doesn't believe that this tension between rationality and simulation works out as intended. Disney only thinks it's in control. Malls only think they are controlling the experiences. It is a story told about a spectacle. He uses Baudrillard's concept of, quote, implosion, close quote, to help understand how all these things are making previously well-defined boundaries fade into what he calls, quote, de-differentiation, a growing inability to differentiate among things and among places, close quote. These spectacles are undermining the very rationality upon which they were built. Like a perfectly charged demolition, the structure is collapsing on itself. This implosion has implications for society and human relations, many of which are negative. I think Baudrillard isn't that concerned with what his orders of simulation mean for society in general and consumption in particular. He doesn't seem to be. Regarding the control and stability issues you have raised, I note that he is unimpressed by the hierarchical. Like the agnostic who would know if, given that God is all-powerful, whether he could make a rock too heavy for him to lift, Baudrillard notes a suboptimality of presence in any original that cannot create a duplicate of itself. He spends much of the second half of the book advancing the duopoly as a more stable form than the monopoly, and the symbolic exchanges between the two poles of a duopoly as becoming more defining than any residual grounding their system might have in the routinely substantive. Ritzer's cathedrals of consumption must fail, according to Baudrillard's paradigm, unless they resign themselves to forming a totality with the customers. Explain what he means by totality. Does he mean that they must seek to totally control customers, or does he mean that the cathedrals must adapt to the customers as readily as they expect their customers to adapt to them? I used the word totality just now to invoke a yin-yang relationship. It implies a lack of primacy and resistance to the imposition of models featuring linear causality. If my understanding of the text is adequate, the supersession of production by reproduction necessitates our modeling the situation as analogous to universal gravity. The Mall of America pulls on the consumer, but the consumer pulls on the Mall of America as well. Then Ritzer and Baudrillard are on the same page. Ritzer writes, quote, This analysis was put in the context of the overall shift from production to consumption. However, one of the things that this work indicates is that it is increasingly difficult to sustain a clear distinction between production and consumption, especially in the contexts analyzed. In the new world of consumption, especially as it is increasingly dominated by entertainment, it will make less sense to distinguish between production and consumption." Close quote. I think this is where I start to differ with Ritzer. An important point he never quite makes in the book is that much of the so-called production done by consumers really is replications of consumptions. Instead of making music, they reproduce music through their CDRs and DVDs and MP3s. Instead of creating a cultural alternative, 
Most people simply repeat what they hear and see on television, in the movies and in magazines. It is true that distinct categories of quote producer close quote and quote consumer close quote are difficult to differentiate due to the ways in which many spectacles are simulated through several orders by the participation of those who are paying for the experience. But in the end, their stuff gets replicated over and over again in a mindless fashion. Ritzer doesn't really address consumer as mindless sheep in a direct manner. What becomes important to the producer of the culture is that you buy the medium, not the message. It is essential that you buy CDs and cassettes. What is a peripheral concern is the content that is carried by these media. This fits Baudrillard well, although technically the essential point is that you must pay the producer for the material aspect and the content, which is certainly symbolic in the conventional sense. I would point out that a reversal of form holds here. The audio content is the original which must be protected from replication via intellectual property laws and so forth, and the items that are prized because they can be replicated, because they can be standardized, are the CDs and cassettes, which must be playable on CD players and cassette recorders. There is an italicized passage in the book where Baudrillard writes, quote, The true ultimatum was in reproduction itself, close quote. This is where he considers the most distinct break from capitalist and Marxist ideology to occur. He states explicitly that the global process of capital is founded in what Marx called, quote, the non-essential sectors of capital, close quote. And by the way, those are Baudrillard's words, not Marx's. He believes that technique dominates value, both by the utility theory of value and by the labor theory of value. Reproduction is not contingent on its products for its justification. It can stand on its own conceptually. Ritzer writes, quote, another self-destructive aspect of the cathedrals of consumption is the ever-escalating need for spectacle. No matter how astonishing, consumers grow accustomed to extravaganzas. In order to attract their attention, let alone their business, the next spectacle must be even more spectacular than the last. Also contributing to this escalation is the competition among the cathedrals of consumption, each trying to put on an extravaganza that is more astonishing than that of its competitors." Close quote. This means we are going further and further into orders of simulation because what we construct as, quote, real, close quote, I think, though Ritzer only implies this, that this further alienates us from each other and from our own desires. We no longer know what we really want or what is fun. We only know what we think will be fun. Though I think movie makers are beginning to catch on to the fact that it becomes so surreal to us at some point that it is better to do less, not more at times. Witness George Lucas's approach to the Star Wars Episode Two. Very little hype on this movie compared to a Jurassic Park or even his own Episode One. Instead, he goes around to openings in small venues and gives the proceeds to charities. He constructs a new kind of campaign that is gentler and seems more honest, and yet it too is a simulation of a simpler time, and not the simpler time itself. Just so. The existence of spectacle, to use Ritzer's word, makes it irrelevant to both Ritzer and Baudrillard whether an original can be located. I think that Ritzer is afraid that one has lost something vital at this point, but that Baudrillard is unconcerned with the question or regards it as meaningless. I wasn't aware that Lucas was doing what you say he was with the new Star Wars movie. It's typical of a movie mogul to believe, or rather to act as if he believed, that so far from one's not being able to go home again, if one simulates having gone home again, one has. Ah, Hollywood. Now, there might be some who would argue that the movies are exactly how we ended up in hyper-reality. I thought it was rather poignant that people on television news programs, which is a first-order simulation at best, were discussing how watching the towers collapse on September 11th felt like, quote, watching a disaster film, close quote, which would be a third-order simulation in that disaster movies are not claiming to be reality but they are claiming to seem like reality. Quote, unbelievable, close quote, was the word I most frequently heard. It was unbelievable because we are so used to simulations, to being able to say to ourselves, when things are uncomfortable, this is not real. Of course, since September 11th, we have managed to experience a number of fourth order simulations, including a recent fundraiser where George Bush gave pictures of himself on Air Force One at the command post after the attacks to anyone who donated $150 to the Republican Party. 
I heard about this fiasco on Jon Stewart's The Daily Show, which is not really the news, but a simulation of the news meant to poke fun at the news, and yet I bet I get more of my news information by watching him than from any other source. Um, and now my brain hurts. The key point about the comparisons of the events of September 11th to motion pictures is that their surreality was used to demonstrate their reality. It was because the footage bore a closer resemblance to a Hollywood action film than to the mundane world that one was to conclude how really real, how uber real, the World Trade Center attacks were. The simulation had become, in practice, the standard by which reality was to be gauged, with an ontological hierarchy granting primacy to that which resembled the simulation above that which did not. I think that the reaction to the attacks afterwards have served to further blur the lines between phenomena and representation, between what we think is real and what we think is simulation. That's why I bring up John Stewart. The truth is that I get as much, if not more, information about the world from his show as I do from CNN, and I am entertained in the process. In some ways, it is like the simulation of the news is so self-aware that it is a simulation that it becomes more believable. CNN is a simulation as well, but it pretends not to be, and that leaves me feeling cheated. I remember immediately after we visited the Badlands and saw the simulated herds of antelope, meaning not that the antelope were simulated, but that the herds were, and wouldn't that make an amusing case study in the rudiments of organizational studies, that we went to Wall Drug in Wall, South Dakota, which is in the westernmost part of the state. Wall Drug had started as a simple pharmacy in the 1930s and had gained international fame by advertising free ice water to visitors. The idea began, quote, logically, close quote, as the owners had noted that motorists arriving in the town of Wall in summer, after traversing South Dakota in the days before air conditioners were installed in cars, tended to be thirsty. So they put up signs throughout South Dakota, offering free ice water to visitors. The whole thing turned into a game. The signs started popping up throughout the United States and then internationally. I have seen a photograph of one in Kenya with two Kenyans standing nearby, looking irritated. The site has gone from being solely a drugstore to being a block-long tourist attraction, with souvenirs and other thematic efforts. It isn't quite a third-order simulation, because a third-order simulation would purport to be about something, when in truth there is nothing behind it. But it's close. It started with a seed consisting only of free ice water. And the owners let you know, via the tone of it all, that they're in on the joke, that it's an attraction stemming from next to nothing. So I'd call it a simulated third-order simulation. Ah, yes, kitsch. Kitschy souvenirs and kitschy buildings. The interesting thing in our experience was that we had just been in the Badlands, and even with the simulated herds, it was more real and grounded. We had visited the Corn Palace the day before the Badlands and reveled in the kitsch, but by the time we got to Wall, I was tired of it. It was boring. I'll save my feelings about Rushmore as a simulation for another discussion. But Carl, I wonder, what kind of a simulation are we engaged in right here and right now? We are conversing on the radio, but is this a real conversation? According to Baudrillard, if I've understood him, the simulated is the real and it is real because it can be simulated, more real at least than what cannot be simulated. Realist of all is a simulacrum that can reproduce itself, and the distinction between the original, a word I've used here only for pedagogical purposes, and the simulacrum is no distinction at all. So I don't know how to answer your question. Well, let's see. A first order simulation would be an attempt to sound like a conversation, which we've had to do up to this point. However, now I am deconstructing our conversation. We might be entering a second-order simulation. Do we dare admit to what has actually been happening? Are we engaged in yet a greater-order simulation than it seems? I'm afraid we are. This entire, quote, conversation, close quote, is really a transcript of an Internet chat session. We've spent several hours, cumulatively, using a popular chat utility, a program allowing real-time text messaging using TCP IP protocol. We decided it would be a clever way to generate a script, as it indicates who has said what throughout, in a style similar to that used in stage plays and, yes, you guessed it, radio dramas. Radio dramas. So instead of quote talking, we have been close typing quote, and this twenty minute conversation typing. has taken several hours over two days to produce. By the time the radio audience hears it, we will have edited and recorded the original text. Then digitized the recording and prepared it to air from the computer to the radio waves. 
Now we leave you to wonder if we are real or simply computer-generated simulations. Carl Wilkerson, and whether the former possibility can have the rigorous ground limit would need in order to be valid, internally consistent, feasible, or anything like that. Objective, global, oh, well, you get the idea. Happy Thomas, my name is actually Mary and I am a computer-generated voice made by text aloud MP3. With me is Peter, also a computer-generated voice. Bob Drillard says that it does not matter whether we are real or not. So, now that we have admitted to being computer-generated, Peter, are you having fun? Ritzer says that all this consumption is expanding because it is fun. I think it is fun to produce radio as well. How about you, Peter? Carl Wilkerson, are you talking to me? I'm not trying to evoke Robert De Niro by asking you. I'm pointing out that I'm not sure that I'm Peter. My voice is Peter's, but Carl Wilkerson is writing my lines. If it helps, I have no idea whether I'm having fun. Or at least Carl Wilkerson has no idea if I'm having fun. Moreover, what is a voice without anything to say? Can it be said to have presence? Perhaps Carl Wilkerson is part of me in the specific case. How am I supposed to know? This is radio. I'm just the voice talent. And even that observation is not mine. Happy Thomas, now my brain really hurts. Who knew that first person plural would mean that we each would have a plurality? Happy Thomas is writing my lines, Yahoo is recording the written text, Mary is speaking the lines, Cool Addy is recording them, but Happy is editing them and Carl is controlling how they get on the airwaves, but CFUV is actually broadcasting them. Where is reality? Does it end with Pappy's typing or with the listener listening and now I believe this has all become too deep for me. The problem with all this is that, if we think about it too much, it just keeps getting more complex. I think I'll suspend my disbelief and just be happy to be on the radio, pretending that the illusion is real. Yahoo! Messenger, Carl Wilkerson has left the conference. Yahoo! Messenger, Patty Thomas has left the conference. Yahoo! Messenger, Carl Wilkerson has locked out. June 8 to 11.03 a.m. Yahoo! Messenger, Patty Thomas has locked out. June 8 to 11.04 a.m.
You have been listening to First Person Plural, because how people get along with each other still matters. First Person Plural is a show created for community radio by Carl Wilkerson and Dr. Patty Thomas to examine social and organizational issues. Music for First Person Plural is performed, composed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson, except where noted. For more information about First Person Plural, Dr. Patty Thomas, or Carl Wilkerson, Visit our website, www.culturalconstructioncompany.com, or email us at fpp at culturalconstructioncompany.com.